We all know where we were. If you're over 40, you remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard the news. There are moments in life when time freezes, when the clock stops. For my generation, this was that moment. 30 years later, shocked by JFK's assassination, then horrified and numb by the tragic deaths of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King, we somehow became hardened to it all. Somewhere between Dallas and Vietnam and Watergate and Iran-Contra, and whatever that Clinton thing was. Conspiracies became easier to believe in than our own government, but still, there were the questions. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. Hello, and welcome to Midnight in America. My name is Daniel Hopsicker, and I will be your host on a journey into the life and times of one of the most famous CIA agents that ever lived, a man by the name of Adler, Ferrum, and Barry Seal. We're standing on the steps of the federal courthouse in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that were walked up and down by Barry Seal many times in the course of his illustrious career. And we're going to take a look at Barry's life and we're going to ask a simple question. Could the scandals of the 1960s and 1970s be somehow related to the cocaine epidemic that swept America during the 1980s, an epidemic fueled in no small part by the billions of dollars worth of cocaine brought into this country by the most successful drug smuggler in American history, Barry Seal. Let's take a look. So who was Barry Seal and why is he so important? Barry Seal was the most successful drug smuggler in American history and the cause of the MENA drug scandal where he flew in by the government's own estimates over five billion dollars worth of cocaine from 1981 to 1986 to fuel the go-go 80s and to fund the Contra war when the US Congress would not. He is the root cause of what is today called the Clinton scandals. So was Barry Seal called the ghost haunting the whitewater probe just an extraordinarily zealous entrepreneur operating all by himself? Did the big-time players in the small backward state of Arkansas, Clinton, Vince Foster, Jackson Stevens, Jim Blair, Don Tyson, stand idly by while Seal made billions, importing tons of cocaine through MENA? Or might the goings-on in MENA, Arkansas of Barry and the boys have been just the continuation of business as usual? In America, we've heard all about the Colombian drug lords whose cocaine and heroin have flooded our nation. Names like Pablo Escobar, Jorge Ochoa, Carlos Lader. But there's one huge unanswered question we've never even heard asked. Who are the American drug lords? Anyone in, say, Washington, D.C.? Could Barry Seal really have been involved with everyone from Republican Attorney General Ed Meese to former Democratic National Chair Charles Manette? to current Al Gore campaign Chairman Tony Coelho? And is there really a suspicious link between Barry and the boss's son, George W. Bush? To answer these questions, we're going back to the beginnings of Barry Seal's CIA career, to hear from eyewitnesses and participants who were there for this most important chapter of America's secret history. That history, in other words, in which lone gunmen play no role. Remember, of the numerous witnesses in Dealey Plaza who pointed to the grassy knoll as the place where shots came from, none were ever interviewed on the evening news until well after it no longer mattered. But that won't happen with the MENA drug scandal. You're about to hear an extraordinary kind of oral history, straight from the mouths of members of the tight-knit pilots fraternity of Louisiana who knew and worked with Barry Seal. While Richard Nixon was still in the White House, Professor Peter Dale Scott wrote, a full exposure of the Watergate conspiracy will help us understand both what happened in Dallas and also the covert forces which mired America in a covert war in Southeast Asia. 
What links the scandal of Watergate to the assassination in Dallas is the ominous merger between U.S. intelligence networks and the forces of organized crime. Most of Watergate's shadow players dwell in the same conspiratorial world that led to the Bay of Pigs, the assassination plots involving CIA mob teamwork, the gun and drug running syndicates formed in pre-revolutionary Cuba, later transplanted to Miami, and the JFK assassination cover-up. Barry Seal, we will hear, was an active participant in all these events, flying guns to Fidel Castro in the mountains of Cuba while the CIA supported him, piloting a P-51 fighter in support of the Bay of Pigs invasion, flying a getaway plane out of Dallas after the Kennedy assassination, and all this before he became famous for importing tons of cocaine through Mena, Arkansas in the drug smuggling scandal that dogged President Clinton throughout his time in office. Commenting on the CIA's affair with the Mafia, LBJ's press secretary, Bill Moyers, said, Once we decide that anything goes, anything can come home to haunt us. This is the story of what happens when guys we pay to protect us, CIA guys, go into business with guys we're paying them to protect us against, made guys, mobsters, organized crime. This is the story of Barry Seal, the biggest drug smuggler in American history, who died in a hail of bullets with George Bush's private phone number in his wallet. The saga of Barry Seal begins here, Louisiana, the only place in the Western world where you can still get a drive through daiquiri in a monogram go cup. In 1699, an expedition of French explorers came upon a clearing at the point where two streams join a bayou 100 miles from the mouth of the mighty Mississippi River. A surveyor marked it off with tiny red wooden sticks. Today, its name, French for red stick, is Baton Rouge, where Barry Seal was born in the months just before World War II. Maybe it's the influence of the Big Muddy flowing by, but Baton Rouge has always had a slightly raffish air. Long before the Civil War, an old steamer here served as headquarters for the gamblers that ran the river, who many a night played cards until dawn. Mark Twain hated this mock castle at Baton Rouge that served as the early capital, but even he praised the magnolia trees, lovely and fragrant with their dense, rich foliage and huge snowball blossoms. Today, the charm of the Annibella mansions back in their shady groves of live oaks and Spanish moss suddenly gives way to an industrial expanse. One minute, you're driving along the frontage of Terra, and the next you see a pile of steel and sheet metal with octopus arms and bulgy pipes and conveyor belts leaning against the river, where America's Fortune 500 churn out the products of daily life, from oil refineries to prescription drugs to the wax coating on milk cartons. But Louisiana has always had a darker side. Your buddy on the Big Muddy wears corruption as a badge of honor. Former Governor Edwin Edwards, for example, is always on trial for something or other, like bribery involving casino licenses. Edwards has already survived 11 grand juries, a pension for gambling and women other than the First Lady, and the bald declaration that his only undoing would be if he were caught in bed with a dead girl or a live boy. A Baton Rouge DEA official told us he'd been way ahead of the country in figuring Bill Clinton out because he'd already seen Edwin Edwards operate. And sources told us Barry Seal paid Edwards so much money to look the other way that it took three small planes to cart it all offshore for deposit. And it's here in Old New Orleans, just a few bends further down the Mississippi, where much of our story takes place where musicians on Bourbon Street still hammer out three-chord blues on old guitars, and where one can find ancient 18th-century skulls and black velvet paintings illustrating the lineages of past voodoo priestesses. Back in the 50s, when Barry Seal was growing up, Baton Rouge was booming, and it was a great time to be a kid, according to author Richmond Odom, who grew up in the same neighborhood as Barry. My oldest brother and, and Barry were very close friends. They started out building model airplanes together and they would fly them. There was a synagogue behind our house and a little vacant lot next to it and they would fly model airplanes out there. And when the boys got old enough to, to really take a, a serious interest in, in aviation, 
Uh, they both went to the old downtown airport where they learned how to fly planes in something called the Civil Air Patrol. Much later, Barry will become the most successful drug smuggler in American history, but the 50s were a time when, as Jimmy Buffett says, only jazz musicians were smoking marijuana. And the young Barry would join a group of guys and pile into somebody's daddy's car, usually a big old clunky Ford or Chevy, and head out to some dance hall to stand around holding a cold Falstaff or Jack's long neck, listen to the music, and try to look cool while working up the nerve to ask the girls to dance. There were also the football trips involving long bus rides. And this is where young Barry Seal first began to stand out. He didn't take the bus. Instead, he flew having gotten the pilot's license at the tender age of 15. Eddie Dufford is the man who taught Barry Seal to fly. Barry was a... That devil was a, 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 a fellow that you couldn't get angry with. He wouldn't let you get angry with him. He'd do something wrong, and, and most of the time, it, everything he did, you know, we had to get on him about it, but he'd just, he'd just look at you and grin, and you say, oh, hell with it, and let it go, you know? You couldn't, you couldn't get him to, to do right. He did what he wanted to do. Oh, man, he was just a kid throwing newspapers for the Morning Advocate and uh, State Times. He was, I think he was just about 15 years old. And his mother didn't, uh, didn't want me to teach him to fly. And uh, I told her, I said, Lou, if I don't teach him to fly, he's just going to go next door. There's four schools out at the downtown airport. And I said, uh, he's going to learn to fly. He's made up his mind. He's going to learn to fly. I said, you want him to fly with me or somebody you don't know? She said, go ahead and teach him. And he was real easy to teach. He was, a, he was the first cousin to a bird. James Poche was a pilot who grew up with Barry. He was a pilot. And he was already, Barry already had a commercial operation. He was a charter pilot. And that's pretty rare in high school. Then, while most young men his age were still working up the courage to ask their girl to go steady, Barry Seal began demonstrating his courage by flying daring undercover missions into Cuba, bringing Fidel Castro's insurgents weapons courtesy of the American CIA. David Holmes is another Baton Rouge pilot who grew up with Barry. Barry was just the kind of guy you could talk to, and he was very friendly, jovial, and everything else, but when you finished talking to him, you didn't know any more than when you started. Yeah, Barry had a lot of secret lives. He loved that James Bond shit, you know. He had, knew Johnny Rivers, had didn't he? The, oh, yeah, yeah. We used to fly Johnny around. Yeah, secret agent man. Was that song about Barry? I often wonder. When did the rumors about his flying P-51 start? Well, that was all around that uh, Cuban time down there when people were you know, being ferried out of there, and I heard rumors to that effect, you know, that Barry was down there flying, he, and he disappeared during those periods of time. The anti-Castro revolution touched Louisiana, and especially its small pilot fraternity, in ways the rest of the country knew nothing about. 